Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back um, to the second panel of the conference on populism in Central Europe. Now, we have a very challenging question um, to answer, whether European integration is a source of uh, uh, populism or a solution to the populism. And uh, after lunch panels are always the most challenging, so that's why I'm very happy that we have four very distinguished, distinguished and provocative speakers, as I was promised. Um, now, in other countries, the European Union is usually framed in two extremes. Either it is the ultimate good or the ultimate evil. And very often the debate on the EU integration lacks uh, nuance. Now, um, that does not mean that we should dismiss the question whether the current shape of European integration in fact is something from which most of the citizens of this partnership of 28 states um, are benefiting. So without um, long introductions, um, let me give the floor first to Mr. Uh, Josef Janning, uh, who is a Mercator Fellow at DGAP in Berlin, and he will start by challenging the myth of the German question. Thank you. Madam Chair, um, I feel honored to be uh, the, the real graveyard slot speaker um, because I hope that by the time I have finished you have recovered from, from lunch. Um, so I think the, the, the topic is um, rather well chosen, you know, my subtopic of German hegemony in Europe, question mark, because this is something uh, that can at least keep some people awake. Um, it does keep me awake. Uh, and as the chair said, uh, I would propose to you um, to understand it as a myth, uh, but not just as a simple myth, uh, but rather as a sort of a complex myth uh, which has uh, quite a significant influence over uh, the way that uh, populist European rhetoric uh, is unfolding. To me, uh, it is a classic case of a populist vicious cycle. And I will illustrate that. But I need to make one argument before I start with that. That is, uh, in the morning we already talked about uh, the fact that a lot of populist movements build on the fact that mainstream is not listening. I think uh, it is true, but it's a bit more complicated than that, because also the mainstream has become populist in a certain way. Ever since Tony Blair um, put new labor into Downing Street number 10, you could see that his definition of what political leadership is was much closer to populist demands because Blair could probably be best described as a leader who wants to lead his people wherever they would be ready to follow. You know? And not in the coal type uh, of leadership is saying, this is where we go, you, you trust me and follow me. And in that sense, Angela Merkel is of the same type. She's also not articulating a strong signal as this is where we're going, but her signal is let's together find out where we should be going. No? Um, and the interesting uh, side uh, of that is why has this change in the attitude that political leaders take not controlled the rise of populism, but rather seem to have further fueled the rise of populism. So I think part of the answer to the question of uh, the rise of populism is not the level of detachment of key policymakers, but there must be other factors coming into play. Uh, and in the morning we already touched on, on some of them. And you will see that in my argument, I will come to that uh, as I go along. Now, the argument about German hegemony assumes that there is A, the will, and B, the capability of German politics to dominate Europe, to shape it according to its own design, and to possess the resources to either convince or to coerce the others into following. I don't think that this is the case if you look at the way that policy is made on the European level. 
It strikes me as the return of a rather old argument. The last time I have heard that argument uh, was uh, before the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, when I was in discussions with uh, social scientists from the then Eastern Bloc, and in their theory of imperialism, uh, it was Germany as the principal imperial agent of the United States within Europe calling the shots. So in you know, and it, it came to me uh, uh, in a very telling way when we had uh, discussions in early 1990 with the then still existing Institut für Politik und Wirtschaft der DDR, where the books that I had been writing, or I'd been participating in, were locked away because we were believed to be uh, um, uh, strange, because we also, at the institute where I worked, we also worked on the so-called German question. In the thinking of our GDR colleagues, it was absolutely no question that uh, whatever way it would go, GDR would have a very quick and easy entry into the European community because of West Germany. Because since West Germany was in control of European integration anyway, what should be the problem? Today, uh, it comes uh, as a similar argument. The current form has two faces. Inside Germany, and in some of the more populist discourses in the so-called creditor countries, this hegemony argument reads, nothing in the EU is possible against our will or our consent. So without our consent, nothing will happen. This is as I call it, hegemony by denial. And this impression has been very much reinforced by the way that Angela Merkel has dealt with the Eurozone crisis. By not taking uh, an open position as the crisis broke out, but by sort of delaying decisions up to the very last moment and then to speak to her own parliament in the, in the, uh, along the lines of there is no alternative. But we now have to do, we have to take a limited step into this and that direction in order to prevent collapse. And this has left a very strong impression uh, on others. In some of the northern populist movements, that has been a very welcome attitude because I've seen they have concluded from this, see, this is, this is how it happens. This is how we do it. We just don't say yes. No, we, we just hold back on agreement until either the terms are right or time is up. In the debtor countries, or the south, if you want to go down uh, that divide, populists argue German power overrules the sovereignty of democratic parliaments using technocratic bodies in Brussels and Washington with no legitimacy of their own uh, to carry out Berlin's directives. So there the argument is that there is, a, there is a fundamental clash between the dictate from Berlin carried out via Brussels uh, and the democratic legitimacy um, in the countries that are under dictate. That is kind of the classic hegemony construct. Both tend actually to reinforce each other. The more um, the, 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 this kind of dictate argument is heard uh, from the south and the north, the more uh, the, the popular debate in the North turns to the conclusion to say, uh, hold on, you know? Um, you know, more of this policy of holding back of denial, because if we give in to this, there is no, there is no limit uh, to that. Both discourses have uh, contributed to the rise of another term that I think is much more relevant uh, than actually the term hegemony um, itself. 
has given, uh, have contributed to the rise of what I call sovereignism as one of the strongest shaping factors of the e-discourse uh, today. And interestingly, sovereignism has grown and is growing in the face of its counterfactual quality. That is, the more sovereignty, factual sovereignty, understood as the ability to shape outcomes, becomes an illusion as a national asset, the more stubborn actors and publics hold on to it. Now, and it's not just you know, populist movements on the fringes. The same thing uh, is coming from Downing Street number 10 and from a couple of uh, political actors well established in their national parliaments, if you look at the two Finns and others. The implicit uh, argument in the denial concept uh, does also not hold up. No. Because this, the argument against our will, nothing's possible, somehow lures people into thinking that with our will, almost everything's possible, which is not the case. No. In reality, things become only possible if you're able to win a substantial which in the EU sense, in EU context, really means a very substantial uh, majority for something. So while on the one end of the argument, people overlook that whenever actors want to shape something, even the power of Germany is not sufficient to guarantee success. And not even the power of Germany's uh, other affluent small neighbors in the Eurozone is sufficient to guarantee success. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, um, the populist argument overlooks that it is national parliaments that are the decisive place to take the decisions about overcoming the structural situation that has caused uh, the sovereign debt. And it is not the IMF or Troika that's actually uh, the key decision maker, they are just, you know, like the controllers in a company. They are just carrying out kind of a, an instrumental duty. So when you, when you look at real power ratios uh, in the European Union, uh, Germany is quite a powerful actor, but not nearly as powerful as it would need to be uh, to fulfill um, uh, something other than hegemony uh, by denial. And I'd like to conclude with, uh, with uh, what Germany would have to do if it wanted to shape outcomes other <coughs> than through denial. Then it would have, A, to adapt uh, the rhetoric and the communication uh, to reality, actually like many EU governments. I would have to do that. Uh, Petro Dulek, Dulek uh, uh, alluded to that this morning. Our rhetoric is not up to the situation. The war and peace rhetoric doesn't convince but rather reinforces the populist prejudice. This Brussels bashing rhetoric uh, rather reinforces uh, populism than countering it. There's a need for an honest, uh, an open communication, which A says, to which degree actually, as Drulak was saying this morning, we need the concerted process uh, within the EU to get things done. Uh, and there needs to be open communication as to the fact that mostly when we speak about Brussels, we speak about us. Because Brussels is not a third, Brussels is us. Brussels is member state governments. Member state governments as legitimized by member state parliaments. Secondly, German uh, policy would have to seek to build shaping coalitions around a revived context, a revived common uh, uh, cause. And there it's a, around a revived Maastricht spirit. Because after all, even, even uh, the United Kingdom, 
uh, and Denmark have ratified the Maastricht Treaty, they are part of European Monetary Union. They are not, just not implementing the third stage of it. But stages one and two, with, with the reporting and monitoring uh, requirements that are part of the stages one and two, currently translated into the European semester, uh, is, is law to them just as well. Oftentimes in the public discourse, you get the feeling that they have nothing to do with it. Now there's the Eurozone, they have all to do with, with the Euro and this whole fiscal uh, 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 coordination there, and everybody who's out has nothing to do with it. That's not the case. So this needs to be revived, and then you need to be uh, building a coalition, a sizable enough coalition around to say, what do we do in order to strengthen governance in the Eurozone? Then Germany would have to reduce uh, asymmetry in European integration. An asymmetry which currently exists because some member states, via the fact that they need support from the others, have to undergo additional commitments. Um, and this, is, you know, this is, a, is a great problem for communication. Also, it's a great resource for populist rhetoric. So Germany would have to consider how could one strengthen commitments of member states to the EU that is not discriminatory. There is one way that is that you strengthen it in a way that binds yourself just as much okay, just as much as the others. And finally, um, you need to define and to codify uh, commitments equally applicable to all member states, as I said, you know, such as, for example, a European veto uh, on national budgets. And then you would also need to launch something uh, which is not, uh, which is a kind of a, a policy initiative which is not uh, uh, following the lines of you know, transferring powers from the national to the European level. And that is a common program on governance reform. Where actually, back to point one, you would have to communicate that the internal affairs of member states, at least in the Eurozone, are the affairs of other countries as well, because they are affected. And since this is the case, we need to act together to seek to reshape the quality of governance around the Union at large. See, these are steps one would have to take if one wanted to counter the populist arguments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for being so strict on time enforcement, but uh, your speech has generated so many interesting questions that I want to make sure that uh, we have plenty of time to, to debate them. Now, in, in, in the first place, I, I, I feel that your argument uh, is that we are experiencing a, a general crisis of politics, or resignation on, on, on leadership where the leaders follow uh, the public opinion. So perhaps uh, the crisis of, or, or, or the populism we are seeing is not so much a reaction on European integration, but it's, you know, it, it would be here even if integration, European integration would not be here. And the second question that I feel we should be debating in, um, after the other speakers um, have presented is um, whether this German argument or German hegemony argument is something um, that, that people feel is an intentional thing, and Germany is being intentional hegemon or unintentional. Uh, because these are two, uh, two different streams of, of debate, whether, whether other countries or leaders feel that uh, Germany has the will to rule the world or Europe or, or whatever, or, or whether some processes are happening just um, as unintentional consequence of, of the strength of um, economy, perhaps. But let me move um, to, to our next speaker, Mr. Vibh Benesh from uh, the Prague-based uh, Institute for International Relations, who is going to talk about European integration as a top-down process. Vibh, next 15 minutes is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, my, my presentation will start uh, from a more general perspective. I'll start with some maybe theoretical or normative issues, some very basic ones. Uh, but don't worry, we'll get to the practical stuff. Um, uh, let's start. What is democracy? Uh, democracy is defined as the government of the people, by the people, for the people. Uh, what does it mean? Government is, means that 
we have uh, we are producing laws of the people means that we are producing laws uh, for the uh, that uh, bind the people that and and engenders obligations and uh, uh, and uh, and rights for uh, for the people government by the people means that uh, uh, the laws are produced by the people either directly or indirectly through their representatives uh, government for the people means that it's in the people's interests what is autocracy Orthocracy is a government of the people. It's the people who are governed uh, by the orthocrat. It means that the laws are produced by the orthocrat. Uh, I'll skip the, the third dimension of, uh, for whom. Now, the EU, is it a democracy or not? Uh, clearly not. Some people argue that uh, uh, we don't want to have the people uh, it's obvious that we do not have the by the people. Uh, we do not have uh, uh, EU-wide democracy because, uh, you know, uh, the European Parliament is not what, uh, what we mean by the representative government. Um, the EU is not an autocracy. We do not have a single autocrat. Um, what is the EU? Is the international organization uh, what is the international organization? International organization is a government. It's a government of the states, by the states. Of the states means that uh, international organization govern the states. You know, the states are subjects of uh, the international law, which is produced by international organizations. And international organization engenders rights and obligations for the states, not for the individuals. That's the case of the Security Council. If you have a Security Council resolution, uh, it does not uh, uh, formalize obligations for individuals, but for the states. The same with WTO. Uh, I, as, a, as an individual, I have no rights or obligations stemming from uh, WTO treaties. The same with NATO. You know, the NATO, the Washington Treaty obliges uh, the Czech Republic to help other states if they get into trouble. But I, as an individual, I have no obligation uh, stemming from, uh, from Washington Treaty. It's done by the states. It's a government by the states. It's the states sitting in, uh, in the Security Council or in UN bodies who are producing the law. Is it the European Union International Organization? Obviously not. A European uh, Union is a government of the people by the states. That's my argument, uh, and don't worry, I'll get to the practical uh, implications. Um, why is the EU a government of the people? Uh, the EU law which is being produced by the European Union is not an international law. There is a distinct quality in the European Union and quite simply said, the EU law which is being produced by the European Union is directly applicable to individuals. Uh, the individuals are, and uh, the EU law engenders identical obligations uh, and rights for EU citizens. Since when? Since the very beginning. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. Uh, it has been introduced, I don't know, it, it already has been somehow stated in the, in the very founding treaties, and it has been uh, reaffirmed in 1963 by the European Court of Justice. Um, why do we have EU law that uh, treats individuals as subjects? Again, the answer is very simple, because uh, this is how the single market is being built. The single market is about four freedoms. Four freedoms for whom? It's about rights and obligations for whom? For individuals and their businesses. If you do not have direct applicability of law, just you cannot have a uh, single market. Uh, you can have a free trade area uh, without, uh, uh, without the EU law, uh, without the acquis communautaire, but you cannot have a single market. So my argument is 
that the EU law is based on the assumption, the very existence of the EU law is based on the assumption that the Europeans are, to some extent, identical and homogeneous. Because if, you, if we were not somehow identical and homogeneous, there would be no justification to give us equal rights and obligations. So my argument is that Europeans are already governed in the EU as the people. Uh, we already have a demos. We already have a group of people, Europeans, who are equal under the law. It's nothing new. It does not stem from the European char Charter of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, Fundamental Rights. It's with us for decades. Who governs? EU still is, a, is the government by the states. You know, the European Council or the Council of the EU still remains the principal decision maker. This is the government. The EC European Council gives uh, political direction and it de facto uh, initiates the legislation. It simply tells the European Commission what kind of EU laws need to be drafted. You know, it seems sometimes to me that the European Commission acts to some extent as a, as a legal service for the European Council. European Council is uh, getting more and more institutionalized. And ultimately, uh, European states can bypass any other institution simply because each, uh, because e European states remain uh, sovereigns under international law. European Parliament is bound by the constitutional order of the EU. It cannot step beyond the EU primary law. The European Council at the end of the day can do that. And he did. The EU is the government of the people by the states. Now, is that government legitimate? Uh, just let me skip uh, back to international organization. Is the international organization legitimate? Does it suffer a democratic deficit? I would say no, because it does not govern people. I it's not necessary to, that uh, uh, for, for the international organization to be governed by the people. It, gov it governs the states. The states are the subject of, of the international law. So it's okay when the states and not the people make the international law. The problem with, uh, with the European Union is that it is not producing international law. It's producing federal law. What we have in the European Union, if you have a look at the nature of the EU law, we already have a federation that somehow assumes that we are somehow, uh, to some extent, homogeneous and identical as, uh, as Europeans. Therefore, uh, uh, we can uh, have the same rights and obligations stemming from the acquis communautaire. My argument is that EU mode of governance is not legitimate because you have a discrepancy between those who are governed and those who govern. Uh, practical implications. If you have a look at it from a practical point of view, uh, you have the EC which is de facto the government of the EU, but the government is not accountable to those whom they govern. Uh, 27 out of 28 heads of government in the European Council are in no way accountable to me. Even though they co-decide about, uh, about the law which is applicable to me as an individual. Uh, Czech heads of, head of government have, has no mandate to govern or co-govern non-Czech Europeans. Uh, each of the head of government 
has a democratic mandate to govern their respective national constituency. None of them has a mandate uh, to govern the other constituencies. As a collective, they have no democratic mandate to govern the European constituency. Uh, and the same holds for the lower levels of uh, the internal governmental structure of the EU. Why do we think that the Czech official from the uh, Ministry of Environment has a right or mandate to shape or decide or co-decide about EU environmental law, which is directly applicable to uh, citizens and companies in Germany, uh, France, or Netherlands. That's a, that's, that's a problem which is, this, this is a fundamental problem and uh, we cannot simply say that this is a cheap talk of, of Eurosceptics. It's a reality. Intergovernmental EU, I'm talking about intergovernmental EU, I'm not talking about international organization. EU is not an uh, international organization. I'm talking about a system of intergovernmental EU which produces EU law which is directly applicable to individuals, but the, the EU law is produced by governments. Uh, it's not democratically legitimate. It's a dictate by foreign governments. Uh, it leads to nationalist uh, populism. Uh, it leads to the system which is dominated by great powers. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not blaming uh, the German government for being dictatorial. Uh, we have 28 di dictators in the European Council. You know, 27 out of 28 are dictators for me. The Czech head of government is a dictator for French people, for Germans, uh, simply because he or she is in no way accountable to them. I mean, in no way. Um, is the intra-parliamentarian EU a solution to the problem? I don't think so. Um, if you simply replace, yeah, two minutes, if you simply replace um, uh, the German national government by German uh, national parliament, you still have the problem. Uh, you simply, you know, uh, it seems like a quick fix. Let's take into account someone who is uh, elected and who is closer to, uh, to people. But we should ask the question, to whom are they accountable? To whom are national parliaments accountable? Each of them to their national constituency. Uh, you know, the, uh, the argument that uh, national parliaments are closer to people, it's a nonsense. You know, the Czech parliament may be closer to people, but German parliament is not closer to me than German government. And the Czech parliament is not closer to uh, Greeks than, uh, than the Czech government. It does not provide a solution. We are heading towards the dictate by uh, foreign parliaments. You know, I don't want the German parliament to decide about law which is applicable to me, and I don't want the Czech parliament to decide about law which is applicable to, uh, to Germans. Solution number one to the democratic deficit. Uh, Europeans are identical and homogeneous enough to be, to be equal under the EU law. If we accept this thesis, we have to say the other part of the sentence. If they are identical or homogeneous enough to be governed by the EU law, they should be identical and homogeneous enough uh, to create this law. You know, the so-called no demos thesis is just a cheap excuse for not allowing Europeans to make the laws which are applicable to them. You know, we are treating ourselves or the Europeans as some kind of immature uh, individuals. We simply let them live in the protectorate of, uh, of European state, arguing that they are not mature enough to govern themselves. Uh, this, this argument stems from the fear that if we let them govern themselves, they will kill each other. But in fact, 
by maintaining the intergovernmental EU, we are perpetuating uh, the nationalism. The intergovernmentalism is a source of uh, nationalist tendencies in the EU. Solution number two is, is uh, simple. If we do accept that Europeans are not identical and homogeneous enough, there is no justification for the directly applicable EU law. And that's, that's my conclusion. It's, uh, we have, we are currently in the, in the middle column. We are, uh, we have a government of the people by the states, which I think is not legitimate. Uh, there are in fact four ways how to, how to deal with the democratic deficit. We can move to federalization. That's, that's, that's the first solution. If we, have, if we are identical and homogeneous enough uh, to be governed as Europeans, there is no excuse for not allowing Europeans to govern themselves as Europeans. A second option, if we, if we, uh, if we uh, are not identical enough or homogeneous enough, uh, this is the, the right column, then there is no justification for the EU law, for the acquis communautaire. Um, uh, okay, so I'll leave it here and uh, I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you very much, Vitku. Another presentation that generated uh, plenty of questions. I'm just thinking in the first part you seemed to suggest that there is no democratic deficit and then I started thinking, so why are we talking about it and why, why, are, there, uh, why are there so many populist parties that uh, get votes? What is it then um, exactly on this anti-EU card, EU as the evil? So what is it that we should be thinking of us as European humans? Is it just because half of the EU citizens are so uninformed or undereducated? Or perhaps there is a lot of rationality in, 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 in their voting for parties that do run on anti-EU ticket, to put it in a simplified way. Um, and to, to bridge to our next um, speaker, um, we just started seeing the first seeds of campaign in European Parliament elections. And if you look at the programs of most candidates in the Czech Republic, Slovakia, um, it's, it's not that much um, different in Poland and Hungary. Um, the main uh, agenda is, I'm going to get something out of the EU for this country. This is the emphasis in, in, in the campaign that is just starting. There is not so much, I'm going to do something for the EU because we are all part of this project and perhaps we do have some common enter interest. Um, and uh, we have with us um, Agata Gostinska from the Polish Institute of International Relations. And she's going to talk um, exactly about uh, the European Parliament elections um, and about their possible consequences for the change of the institutional architecture. Agata, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank the, the thank org organizers for having me here with you today at this very timely uh, debate. Um, I will, for a, for a couple of minutes, distract your attention from this more general debate about the populism sources, um, the tools that the populist uh, parties use. And nevertheless, I think that will that will touch upon pretty important, uh, pretty important issue also for the populist parties, the forthcoming um, European elections. In my intervention, I will foremostly refer to the recently very vividly discussed topic of nominating top candidates for the European Commission president by the biggest EU political families. And I will call this process a personalization of the elections because I think that this term uh, best reflects the intentions behind the idea of presenting a joint candidate uh, to the citizens. And uh, at the same time, this term uh, stresses a possible new dimension of the forthcoming elections 
uh, based on greater competition among the political families. And of course, I will try to judge whether this is going to be the case. So, firstly, I will try, I will try to neaten uh, a general deba debate between the supporters of the idea and the opponents. Um, then I will draw the implications for the uh, forthcoming elections and for this interinstitutional uh, inter institutional setup. And finally, I would like to offer some recommendations um, how to take advantage of this um, obviously uh, imperfect idea of, uh, of personalization as it stands. Um, if, uh, let me please first start with the legal foundation of the idea of the personalization uh, of the elections. This is the Lisbon Treaty that introduced the obligation uh, for the member states to take into the account uh, the results of the elections while nominating the candidate for the European uh, Commission president. And it also acknowledges that a parliament elects president of the commission. This is um, actual, uh, actually uh, the wording that EP used already for decades in its rules of procedure to you know, strengthen its rhetoric on its role in the interinstitutional uh, relations. Now, of course, this wording is subject to very divergent interpretations. Just to give you the idea, of course, uh, supranational institutions will have a different interpretation than the member states. And this is somehow how I will link to, uh, to the presentation of, of WIT. Uh, well, according to the European Commission and European Parliament, these innovations, they pave a way for the EU-wide political families to nominate a joint candidate uh, for the post of the Commission President. And while supranational uh, institutions expect that the member states gathered on the European Council will nominate as a candidate for the post of the Commission President, the top candidate of the party, of the political family that, gathers, that gathered uh, uh, most, most of the, voice, uh, uh, of the voices, yes? or at least that the European uh, com Council will consider this candidate as the first place. Now, of course, this move is opposed to the majority of member states. And as expressed already by, by Angela Merkel, she sees no automatism in nominating a candidate for the European Commission president President with the internal uh, procedure uh, of selecting uh, candidates um, by the political families. It seems that for member states it is another, uh, another parliament attempt to, adva to take advantage of this imprecise Lisbon Treaty provisions to create a new precedent practically extending its powers. Yeah? Now, this already suggests the possible interinstitutional turf wars which we might be witnessing just after the elections take place. And this also signals that member states feel really uneasy with the whole process of the personalization of the elections or uh, also very, uh, very popular term with the Spitzenkandidaten. Somehow the German term is used very often in this, in this debate. Now, uh, it, it seems that uh, the, the concerns of the member states is that this move would imply a better framed consultations with the European Parliament on the uh, possible candidates, which at the same time undermine member states horse trading uh, on, the, uh, on the key EU post. Now, what seems to be for me particularly surprising is not the member states' concerns. It is pretty obvious that member states uh, will rather uh, feel uneasy with any idea of centralization of powers, uh, powers uh, to the supranational institutions. But what surprises me is that this criticism that is, um, that is applied only right now. Yeah? Because just to remind maybe those who are not following this, uh, the integration integration process, the idea is not new, the idea is not uh, groundbreaking. It has been already proposed by Jacques Delors in uh, 1990s, uh, which at that time already reflected the growing role of the European Parliament in the decision-making process. Then it was also heavily discussed during the convention, uh, during the works uh, of the Convention on the Future of Europe. 
and already, already then it seemed to be the only possible compromise between the supporters of the uh, parliament, parliamentarian system in the EU or the presidential one. And um, paradoxically enough, this compromise at that time was put forward by the European People's Party uh, back in Astoria. Uh, the, the political family that seemed to have backtracked a little bit on the whole idea. And actually it is still ahead of nominating its top candidate. Uh, this will happen in March, probably will happen in March in, in Dublin. Now, just a handful of arguments to need in this discussion, as I promised. Uh, to, uh, a handful of arguments of both the supporters of the idea and the opponents. Now, supporters of the personalization believe that it would lead to greater competition and to greater competition among top features, Spitzenkandidaten, and it would boost the competition along the left-right axis, boosting the European public sphere that we are trying to address during today's uh, conference. Now, for, to support the arguments, they show the results of the Eurobarometer, uh, Eurobarometer from 2013, saying that at that time, 50, I think 55% of respondent, respondents said they would be more inclined to vote in the parliamentary elections if the, if the political families put forward the top candidate. Yeah? Now we also have more recent uh, polls which were, um, funnily enough, commissioned by the Alliance of European Conservatives and Reformators a couple of days ago which actually also proved or kind of acknowledgement of the personalization of the elections because in that, according to that poll, 39% of surveyed people said that they were, I will quote, they were happy that member, members of the European Parliament are choosing the next president, as this will make the winning candidate more legitimate. This was in comparison with 27% uh, respondents of who disagreed with the idea and 34% who had no, uh, no idea, well, no opinion on this. In my opinion, this is rather inconvenient results for the European, uh, European Alliance of Conservatives and Reformators because still, yes, 39% said it makes sense. Now, of course, what seems to be blessing for the supporters, this is usually, of course, for the, for the opponents. And the opponents of the idea of the personalization, they focus mostly on the unintended implications, uh, namely the politicization of the commission by the European Parliament. They say, that if we, if we uh, decide to go with this idea of top candidates, we will have a more partisan European Commission, we will have a commission that will be dependent on the European Parliament, and finally, we, according to the read, uh, reading, a uh, commission, uh, commission would not be a neutral institution which would damage its uh, competence as a, leg a legislative agenda setter. Now, I'm sorry, but I'm probably not going to resolve the tensions between uh, both, uh, both parties. However, I would, like to, I would like to point a very different context uh, of this European elections, which in my opinion seem to be sometimes overlooked in this whole discourse uh, between the supporters and uh, the opponents of the idea. Well, in my opinion, personalization of the elections is unlikely to further boost the competition along the left-right com uh, competition, neither it is going to be groundbreaking for the relations uh, between the Commission and Parliament. Thus, the step is going to have a muted effect. Why? Because of this very different context of the election. So first of all, these elections will take place against the background, and we have discussed, uh, discussed this in the morning, against the background of weakening pro-European consensus on the EU affairs, generally. Yeah? Um, and according to the polls which were revealed a couple of days ago by Poll Watch, it seems that 29% of the seats, this, these are very, uh, maybe premature results, but still, 29% uh, of the seats would go to the parties critical or opposed to the EU. Yeah? Now, of course, this rise of Eurosceptics um, will require, and now I probably refer to what Minister Drulak said, will require from mainstream po political forces to speak up, 
and consequently compete somehow around the pro-anti-European cleavages. He was rather saying that the mainstream parties will pick up those problems probably also like free movement of people, which seem to be a, a subject rather to, pro, uh, to, to permissive consensus in the European Union, and it is not any longer. But still, my argument is that the mainstream parties uh, basing on the, on the top candidates might find, might, might find difficult to clearly win the battle with the Eurosceptics. I mean, uh, while well, casting a vote for a political family that selected a top candidate might indeed provide the citizens with the feeling, with the belief or assurance that they vote will increase the impact on the EU-wide politics, still this idea somehow, um, somehow entails associations of further centralization of powers in hands of uh, supranational institutions, yes? So, um, as it stands, this kind of reforms could, uh, instead of strengthening the competition along left-right axis, um, uh, could actually strengthen the Eurosceptic, Eurosceptic, Eurosceptic parties. Now, secondly, uh, and, and this is probably uh, my argument, uh, uh, argument with the opponents of the idea, EP elections will take place in light of the continued efforts to, uh, to complete economic and monetary union. Now, with, with the most recent examples, member states are debating on the single resolution fund. Now, this yet another intergovernmental deliberations, again, it was referring to this, somehow, um, uh, somehow does not, uh, or does uh, add little uh, to, to the calls for greater democratic legitimacy. Now, again, this is also a source of the frustration of the European Parliament, which has been kind of uh, sidelined in most of the discussions on, or in most of the works on further consecutive block, blocks of the a genuine economic and monetary union. But this is also a source of frustration to the European Commission itself. Even though European Commission has been acquired, uh, has acquired uh, new prerogatives uh, uh, in the coordination of economic policies, it's, uh, its monopoly or its uh, competence as a legislative uh, setter, agenda setter has been, has been significantly weakened. Now, of course, what, what it leads to is the stronger, stronger relationship or stronger ties between the European Parliament and the European, European Commission. We could have already observed this in the scope of economic governance. And I think that uh, this is going to be a trend that we are also going to observe after, after the elections. Now, Therefore, if the strategic uh, partnership between the European Commission and Parliament is further strengthened after the European uh, elections, this should, in my opinion, not be understood as a simple consequence of the personalization of the elections, but rather as the implication of the crisis mode of governance, which basically hampered the community method uh, in the recent years and pushed the Commission in the hands, in the arms of the, of the uh, uh, Parliament. Now, I've promised that I would offer some recommendations. I, I, I cannot promise that this will be a, um, a bulletproof. Uh, but uh, I think that in light of the, of, of the above of what, what I have said, now the question arises, so should we or should major political families backtrack on the idea of top candidates? Uh, rather the opposite. I think that the backtracking on the novelties to after all, uh, all the member states signed up back uh, in 2007, could only strengthen the Eurosceptics, yes? Could, to, could strengthen the Eurosceptic rep rhetoric, which will attempt to present this lack of consensus around these uh, institutional innovations as just simple uh, indictment of the European democracy. Now, I think that this might be a little bit provocative, but I think that there is a different reading which could be suggested, uh, suggested and explored. Perhaps we could dispute with Minister Drulak because he said the mainstream uh, political, now in, in, in this context, political families should have courage, uh, courage and be responsible enough to advocate for stronger commission and stronger European pa parliament because we need this, those stronger institutions. 
But I must say that it would be difficult. It would be difficult in times when the when there is no permissive consensus on the EU on the EU affairs. So wh what we've suggested with my colleagues uh, from the Polish Institute of International Affairs in one of our latest uh, latest papers is that maybe it could be worth to present this this EU-wide campaign around the idea of top candidates. Uh, as, as a subtle, subtle diffusion um, uh, from the European Council and from the European pa Parliament, which could at some point reinvent the, the European Commission. Now, let me please explain you why, uh, why we, we believe so. Well, this is because the nomination of the lead candidates uh, could at least, at least encourage better coordination within the EU-wide party families, uh, bringing together the bringing together national parliamentaria, parliamentarians on the issues like top candidates, common manifestos. You've mentioned, you've mentioned programs. In fact, the, uh, the, the mainstream political families, they haven't published their manifestos yet. And I'm really wondering whether there is already this cooperation between national, national parties gathered in the political family, because at some point they will have a common candidate campaigning, yes, campaigning um, uh, campaigning for this for this manifesto. So even though, and, and I am I'm very close to, to finishing, and even though the uh, some of the research um, academic research proves that so far national parties haven't uh, cooperated on the uh, joint manifesto of their political families. Um, it could be that national parties faced with the necessity of supporting one or the other top candidate, they could be guided to, a cooper to cooperate with other uh, parliamentarians on questions such as electoral strategy or the commitments, yes? At some stage, it could lead to their Europeanization. Um, so the calls, uh, the calls that, uh, that, uh, that have been made by already most of the largest European capitals, that we need this kind of greater democratic legitimacy outside the Brussels bubble. Yeah? And again, we can, we can discuss whether this is a solution to the democratic deficit, but this would be somehow reaching out to the concerns of, uh, of some of the, uh, of some of the um, member states. Um, I will stop at this point. Of course, I will be um, happy to elaborate in more detail later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agatha. Um, for, for, for a very interesting update on what is being cooked in the top echelons um, of, of the politics and, I mean, to continue in the role of devil's advocate, um, most of the programs have not been published. Now, many of the candidates have spoken to the people mm -hmm. and I, 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 I am convinced that most of the people who are going to cast the vote, even if those programs are published, they are not going to look at it. They are going to listen to what is said in the TV, in the radio, written in the newspaper maybe. And my question for later is, um, how is this, I mean, very complicated, I would say, proposal of uh, Spitzenkandidaten, and note the unintentional language hegemony. Uh, how is this going to be sold to, to voters who are not experts in EU integration? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, to bridge, I mean, from, from, from technical constitutional debate down back to Central Europe, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have with us uh, Mr. Vlado Bilcik from Slovak Foreign Policy Association, who is going to talk about how the EU integration has been swallowed and digested, whether it has been digested already, in, in the four countries of, of Central Europe. And uh, as we discussed uh, during the lunch, uh, uh, Vlado is going to announce that there is no Central Europe, in fact. I'm not sure whether I'm going to announce that. Thank you, Lucia, uh, for, for the floor, and uh, thanks uh, to the organizers, especially to the Friedrich Ebe Stiftung and uh, the um, uh, Institute of International Relations for having me here. Um, it's, it's always hard to be a hard speaker, uh, the last speaker, and, and when you get your notes together and, and you want to be on the panel and you're the last one, you suddenly start to rethink what you want to say, given what the uh, previous speakers have said. So I'm, I'm going to pick up on the point of century. I want to touch on three things, basically. One is on the question of uh, populism uh, and, and European integration, which is actually a key question of the panel, and I, I don't think we should lose sight of what the question of the panel is. Um, 
Is it a source or a solution uh, to, um, of populism? Is European integration a source or a solution of populism? The second, second issue I want to touch on is maybe a bit of a uh, um, kind of a historical overview of what uh, European integration has meant in, in, uh, in Central Europe. Um, and um, uh, I really want to pick up on this because I think a lot of uh, the uh, pretext of the debate today and also uh, the conclusions stated here have been rather uh, gloomy uh, and, and I think we need to kind of draw a bigger picture to realize uh, where we started and where we got, um, although, you know, we do have problems. Uh, and the third point I want to talk about is indeed this uh, Central European contribution to especially current debate uh, on the state of the EU and uh, the governance debate, uh, which has picked up again in the context of the um, Eurozone uh, crisis especially. Um, so, okay, getting back to my first point, uh, populism. Um, definitions have been made and how do I understand it and how we can relate it to European integration. Um, I think uh, the first panel has tried to dissect this issue a bit. Um, I'll uh, help myself with uh, um, the definition which was offered by uh, Kas Muda about um, 14, 15 years ago when he looked at populism uh, in Western Europe but also considered the East a bit. Um, and um, 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 I think uh, the way I want to uh, look at it is, is more of an ideology uh, which uh, somehow disturbs the peace, the status quo, uh, political, institutional, uh, policy-wise. And he actually talked about two kinds of populists, and both have been mentioned here. One is uh, the, uh, those who were kind of keen to bring up social themes into political discourse, especially in the 1970s, and uh, they asked for more participation on these issues uh, in Germany, but also other places. So the enlightened populists who wanted to change the course of public policy debate. And then we have uh, the latter experience of the 1990s, especially from Western Europe, when you have the dissatisfied masses, which see the black and white picture of the world, and uh, basically they don't ask necessarily for more participation, but what's important for them is more leadership, uh, political leadership, uh, and, and black and white answers. Uh, so you really have a very varied picture of populism and populistic understanding of um, of, uh, um, um, of understanding of populism. Um, if I take these two notions um, and if I tie them to European integration, I think we can see uh, both of these, uh, um, both of these um, uh, ideological venues uh, and, and tie them to, to European integration. Um, we can see the pro-integrationist populists today, and we can see the anti-integrationist populists. Um, the pro-integrationist populists are those who understand that there are all sorts of new complex issues which are tied to the EU crisis, which are tied to um, uh, new makeup of uh, the nation states, and uh, those need uh, uh, new leadership uh, solutions. So basically, you know, if I uh, go back to the definition of populism at the level of nation states, uh, we had those who wanted more participation on complex issues. Today, those complex issues don't necessarily need more participation, but they need actually the output legitimacy. They need clear leadership at the EU level. Um, and those are the pro-integrationist uh, populists who call for more of the EU and for more EU solutions. And they, of course, uh, uh, struggle against uh, the status quo, uh, which, uh, as V has very nicely outlined in his presentation, Presentation is based on the dominance of nation states. And then you have the anti-integrationist populists who see the world more in black and white terms and uh, for them it's necessary to participate in the whole debate um, and, and through that participation achieve at least more of a voice um, on those uh, black and white um, uh, issues. Um, now, uh, let me move on to Central Europe and populism and identification of these two strains of populism, the anti-integrationist and the pro-integrationist. Um, um, I think it's important not to look at just the last two, three, four, five years uh, in terms of uh, our debate where we are in, in Central Europe and uh, how we deal with Europe integration. But it's really a story of the last uh, 20 years. Um, and um, in that sense, um, I think um, 
for large segments of Central European countries and populations, um, um, the um, European integration has been a rather popular project. Um, and populists, or the populistic ideologies, come into play much later, come into play, especially at the moment of uh, the accession of membership of these countries in the EU, uh, or in later stages of membership when they ask the questions, what are we actually doing in the European Union? What's the purpose of being here? Um, and um, um, to answer the question on the panel, uh, my argument, if we look at the past 20 years, uh, is um, European integration has been largely a popular, um, a popular project for, for Central Europeans. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, today it's both um, a uh, solution and a source of uh, populism, uh, but it has an asset of uh, having been uh, an important popular part of uh, discourse and also public policy making in, uh, in Central Europe. Why? Uh, because for most Central Europeans, it's been tied to post-communist modernization, uh, the return to Europe, um, and uh, the um, idea of uh, being part of the European Union was very much tied to post-communist transition. And uh, to me, uh, the extent to which uh, European integration has become um, a um, uh, function of attacks by populists um, very much um, is defined by the degree to which it actually uh, was positively tied to post-communist modernization. Um, if we look uh, at the Visegrad countries, or even if we look at the Baltic states, um, the popularity of European integration, for instance, in Slovakia, um, is very much a result of the fact that um, uh, this was um, an answer uh, to the very existence of the state. So the building of the modern state of Slovakia has been intimately tied to the European integration project. This is much less true, I'd say, uh, for the Czechs, the Poles, the Hungarians. It's perhaps more true for the Balts, uh, where again, uh, the very perspective of the integration project uh, uh, meant um, um, a, a real uh, modern security of, and survival of, of the Baltic, Baltic states. So in century European discourse, European integration um, has been um, assigned very different national identities and uh, um, national um, labels, if you want, and in that sense, um, uh, today, um, what we get in uh, responding to the crisis and in looking at the Central European con contribution to governance debates uh, has to be seen in the context of how uh, the European project and European integration has been tied to the post-communist uh, modernization. It provided um, a certain templates, a certain set of rules, a uh, certain set of values uh, to which uh, the states uh, were more or less willing to subscribe. Um, and uh, uh, the question of what kind of uh, an EU do we want today, which is part of the governance debate which the Central European countries entered, uh, especially uh, with their accession into the European Union, uh, that question um, has very different answers across Central Europe. And in that sense, I'm saying, you know, there is no single Central Europe or Central European uh, populism when it comes to integration. There are various strengths of uh, the uh, anti-integrationist and pro-integrationist populists disturbing the status quo um, in the EU, um, precisely because um, uh, that question um, uh, is, is and has been so tied to the way each country uh, perceived the European integration before 2000, uh, 2004. Um, um, again, um, I'll um, help myself with the example of Slovakia. Um, um, it's, it's interesting the extent to which Slovakia has been able to integrate uh, with the core of the EU without actually having gone through any serious discussion of what kind of what kind of an EU do we want? Precisely because European integration wasn't about that question. It was about the question, what kind of a state do we want? Um, that was the key question. Whereas I think that the issue of what kind of an EU do we want and what kind of a state do we want uh, is an issue which was much more separated in the Czech lands, in Poland, and in Hungary. Um, uh, when we look at uh, the governance debate, um, again, um, which 
by and large, was concerned until recent years with the aim of these countries to participate in the EU, uh, and today raises issues of how far do we want to participate in this and that policy, what kind of an institutional framework do we want. Uh, when we look at that, uh, that debate today, it's, it's striking how different the Slovak case and the Czech case has been until recently, certainly, uh, because the Czechs are very much in the same position as the Slovaks. Uh, they could be institutionally, politically, um, for Slovakia is in the European Union, but they just simply chose not to be there. Uh, and I think it has largely to do with the fact that the Czechs didn't see the European integration and the EU as the only modernization project in the post-communist transition. And also, they came out of a different basis in terms of uh, their own domestic capacities as a state. Uh, it's interesting to look at Hungary, of course. Uh, we already had a uh, very strong presentation of Hungary, uh, but uh, Hungary today, when we look at the governance debate and the inclusion in the core of the EU, Hungary is in a position where it actually cannot be in the core of the EU, and it doesn't want to be in the core of the EU. So perhaps Hungary doesn't want to modernize altogether. Uh, and when we look at Poland, uh, uh, Poland um, wants to be in the core of the EU, or uh, there are voices which call for that. Um, uh, but uh, um, um, and, and, and it's, it's more of a normative debate. It should be in, in uh, the core of the EU, and perhaps uh, it could, although at the moment there is a big question mark. But again, it's not just about modernization. It's about the EU as a strategic project. So in a sense, um, the responses of the um, uh, four Visegrad countries, if you want, to the governance challenges today, and the governance challenges stemming from not just the reshaping of the treaties and the adoption of the Lisbon Treaty, but especially governance challenges stemming from the crisis and the emergence of the uh, almost uh, separate and alternative European project in the, uh, in, in, in the shape of uh, a more intergovernmental uh, Europe through the fiscal compact or a selective uh, and a separate uh, European project uh, through the new institutions uh, which, which are arising um, as a result of uh, the uh, increasing costs of maintaining the Eurozone, uh, we see uh, very different or uh, very separate responses of uh, certainly the four Visegrad countries. In that sense, when it comes to debating um, the um, uh, management of the public debate vis-a-vis -vis the EU issues, um, uh, we can't talk about a single Central European populism or um, strong pro-integrationist or strong anti-integrationist voices, but we need to consider very carefully the national debates. Uh, we are facing today not a single European debate, and that's why it's so difficult to talk about European candidates, but we have very separate and increasingly separate 28 uh, national debates on, uh, on, on EU issues. Um, and governance in this sense um, paradoxically, in countries which seem to have the least problem with, uh, uh, which seem to have the least problems with um, uh, the um, uh, pro-integrationist um, populism for, with disturbing the status quo, the governance issues often play the least role. Um, again, I'll help myself here uh, with the example of uh, uh, Slovakia, uh, which uh, is lucky enough to be in the core of the EU politically and institutionally, uh, but uh, which uh, doesn't seem to care so much domestically uh, necessarily how uh, the core uh, functions, how it works, and what sort of a contribution it makes uh, to that core. Uh, we uh, continue to have um, the lowest rate of participation in the EP elections, and I don't think it's going to change uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the elections this year. Perhaps Croatia is going to help us and uh, have an even lower turnout, uh, but uh, this, this continues to be, uh, to be a problem. Also, our national parliament is probably one of the least national parliaments involved in EU affairs. We are the only country which uh, doesn't have at the moment a permanent representative uh, representing the national parliament in the European Parliament. So again, uh, our ability to, um, to actually uh, be part of that complex governance structure, um, and not just ability but also willingness, is, is limited in that sense, uh, having picked up on uh, Wiet's um, presentation.
in the model. Uh, Slovakia's uh, take on uh, European integration um, has been very much a take on which uh, equated uh, integration with uh, state building and state modernization. In that sense, it is the government, uh, the EU is the government uh, uh, of our people, uh, but uh, uh, through fundamentally and only our state and state institutions, and the people are happy with it. So, um, um, again, when we consider the various models of democracy and legitimacy, we need to look uh, at uh, both the input but also the output. And the output of integration as a project in Central Europe by and large, at least in uh, the first 10 or 15 years after 89, has been very positive. Now we see a more differentiated picture and that's why we have the challenge of uh, populism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vlada, also for bringing the debate back to the people. I just uh, wanted to add a footnote that uh, Vlada was very actively participating for many years in, in public debate uh, projects about the European um, integration, and he, he witnessed uh, how, how the governments, uh, no matter which color governments, uh, do underestimate uh, sincere, honest, and multi-stakeholder uh, discussion. So, so this is also another point that uh, European populism does start at home when the national leaders refuse to create conditions for a, for a debate about European integration. Now, we have um, some time for, for questions um, and, and comments. So if you would like to contribute to the debate or, or pose a question to, to one of our speakers, uh, please uh, somehow indicate it and introduce yourself. Yes, please. Oh, just press here, okay. So um, thank you um, again for um, a great lecture. My name is Daniel Stech and I'm from this building, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'd like to ask two questions. One um, question goes to Mr. Um, Vilcik and I'd like to ask who are the pro-integration populists today? Because it seems to me, I, I know a lot of anti-integration populists, but I have noticed any pro-integration populists in Central Europe, or at least in the Czech Republic and Slovakia perhaps. And my second question goes to, to, to Mr. Benesh. Um, you suggested, it seems to me, that the European Union is, lacks legitimacy or it lacks democratic legitimacy because it's a government of the people by the states. And then um, you suggested that the, especially the European Council is a body in which um, the heads of government are only accountable to their electors, to their own people. Now. Um, just a remark, then, then I would like you to, to, to explain how you see this. But um, first of all, um, you know, members of European Parliament are elected. The governments um, that sit in the European Council and their representatives are elected. Uh, the European Commission is a result of a legislative process which involves the European Parliament and um, the Commission. So I, I see no lack of legitimacy there. And when you compare the European Council and you say that there are, uh, you know, 27 of these heads of government are not accountable to us as Czechs, it's very similar to what happens in the Czech Senate, isn't it? Because you've got 80 senators who are not accountable to me at all. You know, only one of them is, and sometimes I, 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 you know, I understand they, the other senators might want to vote in, or um, you know, uh, they represent a different interest. And ch the Chamber of Deputies is the same thing. So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Vladimir Handel. I'm from the Institute of International Relations. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, of course, thank you for the perfect presentations. Very dynamic and very interesting. My first question goes to uh, Josef Janning uh, on Germany. And first of all, I agree with your uh, very interesting analysis of uh, Germany being hegemon by, by veto power. Uh, um, I would add also that Germany, German hegemony, if any, uh, and it's, it, it's a really incomplete uh, hegemony because Germany doesn't really lead in the area of foreign, foreign defense policy. And we've heard uh, and we've seen that some, some kind of more initiative sort of approach to uh, defense and security now is now, now coming. What is your expectation? Second question on, on, uh, on still on Germany is on the constitutional court which, which uh, uh, disrupt, I mean, abolish the 3% uh, 
uh, threshold for uh, European elections. What do you expect, it, uh, expect to be the result of it? Uh, do, do, do you expect to some of the nasty uh, far right uh, to enter the European Parliament? So yes, yeah, your assessment. And then on, uh, on the other uh, speakers, it's a, it's a lovely uh, uh, experience to see whole Visegrad present here in, in, in this room and present in su such a f wonderful way. I've, I can't have a question on each of you, but uh, perhaps if any, any of you could comment on Visegrad as a sort of um, added value in terms of dealing with these issues which we are discussing today. Populism, uh, European policy making, democracy, democratic deficit, uh, coming together, I mean, it, it, uh, uh, making some added value to European policy making. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tomasz Seter and I'm from this building as my colleague here. I would like to ask a question, uh, Ms. Gosteńska. You mentioned uh, the new phenomenon of European Spitzenkandidaten and I would like to ask you how this concept is going to work if the national parties don't use them in their campaigns. So if there is a Spitzenkandidat and I don't hear about him because our parties don't talk about him at all, they don't have him on their billboards, what legitimacy, what European white legitimacy does he have? Thank you. And we will start in reverse order, which means that Vlado, you will be first. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions. Um, a very good question. Thank you. Who are these pro-integrationist populists who actually uh, want to have more leadership or more EU answers to uh, complex um, uh, issues which the member states cannot deal with. Um, uh, I have several names in my mind. I know it's, po it's not popular to be a pro-integrationist um, uh, populist these days, but uh, 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 I think um, I'll give you at least three names. Uh, one is since you're from this house, uh, having listened to Petra Drulak this morning, I think uh, he is a pro-integrationist populist, um, the way I outlined it. Uh, and, and I think it's very clear, not just from what he said today, but also from his writings. Um, uh, I think uh, in, in uh, uh, several respects, uh, Radek Sikorsky, is a pro-integrationist populist uh, with, um, again, in line um, with uh, my definition and um, his both speeches and, and papers. Um, coming, coming home, it'll be interesting to see who, um, how the debate will actually turn out uh, in the run-up to the EP elections um, in, in all these countries. But there is certainly one pro-integrationist populist who is going to be running in the Slovak EP elections, and that's uh, the current member of the European Commission, Maro Ševčovic, uh, who, in my mind, again, is someone who is uh, domestically disturbing the peace of the status quo and actually arguing for those uh, EU answers to complex problems and solutions. So those are my three names uh, to at least give you some sort of an answer who these people are. Um, um, a Hungarian name doesn't come to mind to complete the Visegrad uh, picture, uh, but maybe Maybe uh, um, Bali Miner can help me uh, with, a, with a Hungarian name. Um, uh, on the question uh, uh, that uh, Ladia Handel asked about uh, the, the role of the Visegrad, um, and you know, you post basically this and that policy making, governance, that's your legitimacy. Um, populism, what can we do together? Um, maybe I'll just pick one issue which, which I find very topical today. And uh, I also try to talk about Europe integration as, as, as a real positive and popular issue in Central European context because I think it continues to be something which inspires. It may not inspire in the West, I think it still has inspirational uh, momentum in Central Europe, but it certainly uh, inspires fundamentally in what I wouldn't even call Eastern Europe, but the new Central Europe, and that's uh, Ukraine today. And I think uh, one of the things that the V4 could do together, uh, and, and should do together more, if we can agree on a lot of internal EU issues, is uh, to be able to uh, have a single voice vis-a-vis -vis our common biggest neighbor, uh, which is a non-EU neighbor, and, and also not just common voice, but maybe common political push with 
you know, uh, certain lines, certain resources. I mean, there is the Visegrad Fund, which can do some things, but uh, there are also uh, collective efforts of, of the member states. Um, we, of course, we have to wait how th things unfold in Ukraine, but, but certainly that's one thing where I see space for Visegrad, uh, for very active, common um, EU policy, which uh, keeps the popular and um, positive notion of integration alive. Gatak, if you could also elaborate um, yes. on, 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 on the earlier question of how this complicated thing yeah. can be sold to the voters. Thank you very much. But could I also start with reversed order yeah. so that I would also comment on, on, uh, on the uh, recent remarks on the V4 uh, platform. Um, as we, we actually tend to meet pretty often lately uh, with Vladimir and we discuss what is the common, you know, common denominator for the Visegrad group to, um, uh, to speak up jointly on the EU affairs. And um, we've already agreed, I think, many times that we've been uh, pretty successful on these traditional uh, fields of, uh, of policies, yes. We've been pretty successful on the, uh, on the enlargement policy and the Eastern, uh, Eastern partnership. We've been successful on the energy, but still when it comes to the uh, political vision of the favor European integration, when it comes to our, uh, our vision of the genuine economic and monetary union, we still have divergent, divergent opinions. It is pretty normal because of, you know, uh, different, um, different economic models um, uh, as well. But what, what we've observed, and at least it was always my point, is that there is a common denominator for the V4 uh, to boost its cooperation. And this is a common concern of, um, uh, of European Union, or rather Euro area, favor consolidating and leaving us behind. And I think this is, this is something that could boost our cooperation and, and um, reduce the negative implications of the uh, Euro, uh, Euro area consolidation if this happens. We have shifts in the council uh, voting rules um, becoming effective from 2014. This will mean that V4 will have to work even closer to form greater coalitions of member states to, uh, to put forward the ideas. But here just uh, the last remark is that I've already seen um, a very promising, a promising result of we were kind of maybe even being inst institutionalized in a way. We all gather before the European Council meetings, yes, before we, we European Council gatherings, and we try at least to coordinate our stance, which in my opinion bodes well uh, for, the, for the cooperation. Now, uh, the question about the Spitzenkandidaten. Uh, perhaps I haven't stressed, uh, stressed that in my understanding, the idea of top candidates could be just a starting point for the greater uh, coordination of national parties or national parliamentarians on the EU affairs. I would be probably, it would be probably premature to state right now if it is going to work, because the, um, the research shows, and I can, I can give you a pretty interesting numbers, in 2009, according to the Professor Bastos, uh, a PES, uh, uh, so Party of European Socialists, that, um, uh, that came out with a joint manifesto. It received only 13 national contributions to its manifesto. I, uh, I would expect a rather greater cooperation, but it still would be premature, especially, I mean, we'll have to see. There are some recommendations um, uh, coming from the resolution of the European Parliament like um, European Parliament is inviting national parties to use the logo of the uh, common political families. And I will be really monitoring this. I want to see when the, when the campaign is in full spring, in April and in May, I hope to produce something short on this, whether this small, tiny, you know, symbolic 
uh, simple link thing has been implemented, we'll see. But we have already uh, a, a very uh, disappointing, uh, disappointing signals uh, with regards to uh, this cooperation on the idea of uh, top candidates. Uh, you know, uh, even M M Martin Schulz, the current president of the European Parliament, who has been still designated, he hasn't been fully nominated as a top candidate. He hasn't got a support, for instance, of the British Labour Party. I mean, and uh, the British Labour Party, it's rather influential member of the political family. So it, it, it will probably always cause clashes, yes? But somehow, I mean, I think that for the first time these national parliamentarians are, are faced with the necessity to choose. I mean, at some, time, at some point, you know, this or the other candidate will, will be representing the joint manifesto of the political family. The, a different case could be with the EPP family if it decides to nominate as its, as its top candidate a person who is not running for the European Parliament elections. This is probably also going to cause some, uh, some vivid discussions about the, um, uh, about the advisability of this step. Um, and the last thing I think it was on the, uh, um, on the, the whole idea of the Spitzenkandidaten, yes, how it is going to appeal to the, uh, to the ordinary citizens uh, who are not aware basically of this Brussels bashing, yes, uh, that Josef, Josef was referring to. Well, this is, this is the argument that uh, most of the, let's say, Eurosceptic parties um, has been presenting, like the, mentioned by me earlier, the European conservatives and reformators. They were saying, we are not going to sign up to this pro-federal, pro-integrationist idea. Um, we are not going to nominate a top candidate um, because this would mean we are signing up we are signing up to this process, plus the citizens, they do not even know, yes, who, who is the European Council president. Well, I don't think that this is solving, this is solving the problem, yeah? And, um, and probably, I, as I, and this is, why, this is why I stressed that backtracking on this idea wouldn't be a solution either. It could add up to these uh, Eurosceptic uh, Euro voices, Although, and probably I would have to stress this, although I do understand the concerns of those, concerns of most of the EU capitals, saying that in times of this, uh, you know, crisis that we are still, that we are, um, uh, that we are still uh, getting through, um, visions of huge European leaps uh, could fuel this anti-European populism. And this, this is uh, actually what has been also stated by, uh, by, our, um, uh, by our officials. I mean, uh, but at the same time, at the same time, we could offer uh, we could offer a different uh, a different rhetoric uh, rhetoric to this. Um, I think I've already exhausted my time. Thank you, um, Vitko. The floor is yours. If you could also reflect on on the earlier comment that if an academic case can be made that there is maybe no democratic democratic deficit, how come people are talking about it and and I mean voting according to it, or, or, or how come they are attracted to the parties that say we need more democracy in the EU? Uh, I'll start with your earlier question, if uh, you have posed uh, after my presentation, uh, why, why do we have Eurosceptic populism in the EU? Uh, my, my argument is that uh, because they are right because uh, the European Union is not democratic. Uh, the EU government is not uh, accountable to those who are governed. But I would like to add that, uh, we should also ask the question, why do we have a democratic deficit in the EU? And the answer is to some extent that because we have Eurosceptics, because it's, it's the Eurosceptics who uh, according to my opinion, wrongly argue sometimes that we do not have European demos. My argument would be we do have, uh, we assume to have uh, European demos uh, uh, since 1963. Um, they tend to stick to the intergovernmental 
model, and they forgot that uh, it's the intergovernmental model which is the, the reason for the democratic deficit, because then people are governed by foreign governments. Um, um, uh, I don't know, uh, can we put my, my, my last slide in, uh, in, uh, on, the, on the screen? Um, I want to, uh, the last slide please. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I want to tackle also the issue uh, you have asked, uh, we, have, we have discussed in the discussion uh, the issue of uh, pro-integrationist uh, Eurosceptics. Uh, I think, you know, uh, in my presentation, the central top uh, uh, cell, the Federation of Nation States, this is where we are, and everyone else around can be Eurosceptic. The hardcore federalists can be Eurosceptics. Uh, the Finn Federation, this is Libertas of uh, the Clan Genli. Uh, they argue that uh, uh, the, uh, the European Parliament should be strengthened, but the EU competencies should be lowered. Uh, that was their argument that we need, I don't know, directly elected uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, etc. Uh, the, the lower uh, right corner international organization, this is UKIP. Uh, the, the international organizations sui generis, these are soft Eurosceptics like ODS, they advocate the, uh, the continuation of the single market, so they advocate the four freedoms, but at the same time they uh, want to stick to the institutional setup, intergovernmental mode of governance, and, and they want to narrow the scope of EU competencies. The FIC international organization, I think that this is French government and they to some extent are also skeptical because they are skeptical about, uh, 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 about uh, uh, some of the supranational issues like direct, probably direct applicability of the EU law or, or European parliament. So anyone around can be Eurosceptic. Um, going to next question, uh, what is the difference between, uh, that, that is a very good question, what is the difference between Czech Senate and, uh, and the European Council? Uh, because in European Council uh, these people are also elected uh, and the Senate is also elected and the Senate, the difference, the difference is, uh, formal difference is the Senate is elected in uh, Czech-wide elections. Uh, each of the senator is elected in a particular electoral district, but that does not mean that he is accountable to this particular electoral district. There is some oath of a parliamentarian and he swears to, uh, that he will represent the whole of the Czech nation, uh, whereas in the European Council you, these people are elected in their national electoral districts, not in the EU-wide elections, and they, in principle, are not required to represent EU-wide interests. Each of them is required to uh, represent uh, uh, the interests of their own electoral district. So this is formal thing, and then there is one practical thing, and that is the existence of political parties. When you vote for the Czech senators, you are not just voting for an individual, but you are also voting for the party. And even though you, each of the uh, senators is not de facto accountable to you because he was elected in different electoral district, the party itself, which he represents, and which he himself is accountable to, is accountable to you. Because the party as a whole fields candidate in the uh, Czech-wide elections, and uh, it's, it's, the, it's the bond that allows us to say that the, that, uh, that the Czech senators are not accountable just to their electoral districts, but through the party, which is also accountable to you, even if, if you understand me, they are accountable also to other people in the Czech Republic. So that's why the political parties are important.
because uh, they allow the individuals, even though the, they were elected in uh, separate electoral districts, to be accountable to the Czech electorate as a whole. And I, I don't know, may, may I have one more minute? I want to, uh, short, short minute, to uh, go to the issue of uh, the top candidates. I cannot miss the opportunity. Uh, competition, how can we speak uh, about competition when the European political parties are not allowed uh, to fight in the elections? There is no competition between them. They do not compete between each other. You know, uh, the EP elections, uh, I cannot vote for or against European political parties. I can vote for their proxies. So there is no direct competition between them. There is a competition between the national proxies of those political parties. How can we speak about competition when uh, grassroots challengers are not allowed to run in the, in the EP elections? Imagine, imagine a grassroots pan-European party. What do they need to do when they want to stand in the European Parliament elections? You know, they are forced to set up 28 national political parties which is ridiculous. How can he speak about competition? How can we speak about the legitimacy about the top candidates when those people are the candidates of European political parties which do not compete in the, in the, in the European elections? These are quite, quite serious questions. Uh, you know, it may seem like a symbolic issue whether uh, there is a national party on the ballot box, on, on the ballot, uh, uh, or whether there is a European party. But I think that it's it's very important issue, and we seem to forget that this is a crucial issue. Whom can we vote? And we still cannot vote for European parties. So that's 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 a, that's a problem. How can? What is the source of the legitimacy of? Uh, of, uh, of Mr. Schulz, or what is the source of legitimacy of, of, of European socialists? Nobody voted for them, forget it. Thank you for adding skepticism on this beautiful sunny spring day. Now before I give the floor to, to, to our last speaker, let me just check with uh, the remaining part of the Visegrad group. Uh, Mr. Madia, would you like to react on the Visegrad question? No, okay. Uh, so, so let's go back to Germany, to the Germans and their hegemony or non-hegemony. Yeah. Who is afraid of them? Are they afraid of themselves? Uh, yeah. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to make three points. One, picking up, uh, Lucia, your question at the beginning. It seems to me that uh, some of the explanations from this morning are highly relevant. What drives this sovereignism attitude um, the most, in my view, um, is this is the is the feeling of uneasiness in the wider public? I'm not speaking about populist activists, but I'm speaking about you know their the the, the resonance that they receive, uneasiness um, because of the dialectics of globalization. You know, the more globalization progresses, the more people develop a sense for some identity that they seek, regional or national. Uh, city was suggested in the morning. Um, uh, I think th this this is this is something that the populists have not created, but they live off. Is that people um, uh, are not at home yet in a kind of borderless uh, environment? I think that needs to be uh, taken into account. This is not something that you that you can uh, teach in school uh, or that you can easily uh, switch to, it will take time. And it probably will take quite some time for people to discover in how far could Europe be home. You know? And as long as you are the widest horizon that you have beyond Europe is a tourist ghetto in Tunisia or uh, Kenya or the Maldives, that lesson uh, doesn't come easy. On Vladimir Handel's question, um, hegemony is incomplete, uh, he said. Well, I would say it's not hegemony, but it's, uh, it's a fairly strong leadership position. Uh, yes, I believe we will see initiatives on foreign 
and security policy, including defense. Uh, but as usual with uh, today's Germany, um, it won't be frightening. You know? uh, don't be scared. Uh, there will not be uh, a cascade of initiatives or uh, strong leadership. But there's the willingness of the uh, of three actors next to the chancellor. That's the Foreign Minister Steinmeier, Finance Minister Schäuble, and Defense Minister von der Leyen to actually drive this uh, agenda forward. Um, and I think it will most likely lead first off uh, to a renewed interest of uh, these foreign policy actors in uh, finding and activating partners because that has been neglected over the past years. Karlsruhe, the other question. The Constitutional Court's ruling on killing the 3% threshold after it had killed the 5% threshold a number of years ago. That will mean that um, about 10, maybe 12 seats uh, of the 96 uh, German seats or the 96 seats decided uh, in the German election uh, as part of the European election will go to uh, parties uh, previously not represented. Among them NPD, among them uh, Alternative für Deutschland, IFD, uh, among them probably some Grey Panthers or what have you. Uh, the Pirates, uh, they, they may also be in. It is not easy to calculate what the impact on their result will be because uh, we can't really tell from previous uh, results. Um, because voters vote strategically. Quite a number of voters uh, who would like to vote for NPD at the end of the day don't do so because they think it's going to be lost, a lost vote anyway because they won't make the threshold. With no threshold, that consideration doesn't apply any longer. The other important element of the Karlsruhe ruling is what Karlsruhe says, well, there are more elements you now in the way that, that this court is now entering into politics, I think is, is also a, a rather delicate and complicated issue. Uh, but the, the, the grounds on which Karlsruhe ruled, the Constitutional Court says there must be a good reason to not um, give top priority uh, to the constitutional guarantee that all votes are equal. And they would accept uh, that if a parliament has a very important function in stabilizing um, the political system, which is not just the government but also the legislative process, then a threshold is justified in order to control fragmentation. Now they argue, since the European Parliament doesn't have an important function, this doesn't apply. So this, I think, is, is uh, that's, that's quite that's a, a, a bomb that they have placed in the, in, into the German debate. Because the candidates, Martin Schulz <coughs> and others, all the national Spitzenkandidaten, they run around and tell the people that this parliament has never been more important or less important, uh, more important than, than it is today. That its importance has continuously grown and now it is the co-legislator. And the constitutional court says it's not important enough to even uh, merit a 3% threshold. So I think this, this, this is something that will uh, in a way play out in the, in the campaign. It may lead to a fact uh, that the uh, 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 participation in the vote will continue to drop and neutralize completely the effect that has been hoped for with the Spitzenkandidaten election. Now, that it actually gives more personalization, that gives more interest, that gives a bit more spice uh, to, uh, uh, to the political debate. I think that uh, so far uh, the, the so-called mainstream parties um, are still too much tempted, uh, as was, was already assumed this morning, to push kind of the, the populists and Eurosceptics aside instead of taking them on. 
No. I'd say you need to take them on. And if that's done, and if that's done also in the next European Parliament with 30% of Eurosceptics there, uh, we may hope for somewhat more lively debates, somewhat less of this usual, very usual rhetoric, uh, and a bit more, you know, brain power uh, on the on the pro-EU side uh, to argue their case. Thanks. Thank you. Since there are less women than men on the panel, they can speak more. So Agatha wants Thank to you. have one just, last sentence. Just a, very, <laughs> just a very short comment. Actually, we almost have a gender balance, but it almost never happened. Yeah? Uh, now, I just thought that maybe if we knew the, the verdict earlier, or if yeah. the European Parliament strate strategists knew the, the verdict earlier, they wouldn't have put this motto, this time is going to be different, yeah. as, their, um, as their main motto for the, for the, for the election campaign. But I just also wanted to uh, very briefly refer to, to what you just said. The mainstream political families, they might, uh, might be forced to tackle the issue if the new political groups or uh, radical anti-European or at least Eurosceptics are going to be formed. Because we have these first signals that, uh, that such a new political group might be formed. It seems that according to these polls uh, made by, by Poll Watch, it's, they already have an enough uh, possible parliamentarians coming from six member states, so they would just need another one to form, uh, to form a, new, um, a new political group in the EP. Then we would see that the mainstream parties would have to engage more thoroughly in the debate. Yeah? Thanks, and sorry for... <laughs> I have to no. apologize. Men never okay. apologize if they speak longer. Anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. We are half an hour past uh, the, um, the, the, the announced um, uh, end of the conference. So um, let me thank in the first place to, to our panelists for bringing also some humor. Now, as, as is always uh, the case with uh, foreign policy conferences, they generate more questions than, than they actually give answers. Uh, let me thank to the organizers and on behalf of the organizers to all of you. And uh, have a very good day thinking about European populism. <laughs>